everybody. Good Wednesday evening. I'm Pastor Will. Thank you for tuning in and hopping on to join us for our Wednesday evening Bible study here at View Church of God. So we're so glad that you've decided to join us and hope that you've got your, your pen and paper ready, your Bible, and, and we're ready to dive into God's Word. Again, I, I'm thankful you're here and uh, still meeting a little bit different, but I'm glad we can still come together and worship and, and, and really study God's Word. Now, as we begin with our service tonight, again, I want to always remind you, thank you for how well you have been uh, sending in your tithes and your offering through the mail, uh, those that have been giving online, and even the sh th thank you for coming to our services that we've had here in the sanctuary and been giving that away. So thank you, please. You can continue to, to give through the mail. Our address is 316 Wentworth Street, Bude, Mississippi, 39630. You can continue to give online using the Tithely app. Uh, there's info below. You can also find a link in the comments. Or, yet again, as I've been saying, you can bring them to church and give in the sanctuary. That's right. This coming Sunday will be our third Sunday back in the sanctuary. We had another great service this past Sunday, and we're, we're looking forward to this Sunday. I encourage everybody to come with just a sense of excitement and ready to worship together. And this Sunday, we're also, we're going to, at the end of our service, we're going to recognize our two seniors, Miss Anna Tyson and Miss Chloe Phelps. We're going to present them with some gifts from the church, and we're going to pray over them. So we want to encourage family, friends to be here for that, and we'll have a, have a wonderful service loving on these two precious girls. And I've, I've got a favor I want to ask of you all. Now... Father's Day is going to be coming up fairly soon. So I want to put something special together for Father's Day. I want you to make a video and I want you to answer this simple question. My daddy says, and you fill in the blank. Can you do that? Just uh, film your kids and say, uh, now what does daddy always say? and film them with a response. Now, but I just don't want the children. I want to hear from some of you adults too. What is something that daddy always said? Uh, maybe some of you, um, the well you're young at heart, what was something you remember that your father always said? So if you would, make a video of that. Uh, let me know. Uh, send it to me. Text it. Facebook Messenger, however. And uh, just let me know. We'll, I want to put something special together for our Father's Day service. So, my daddy says, and fill in the blank, okay? So, we do have several prayer requests. I want you to remember these names. They'll be listed on the screen. And we got a lot of needs that have been pouring into the church. This is, as I've said before through this season, if there's ever a time that we need to be praying, church is now. This is, there is no excuse for, for we not to be people of prayer. Many people stand in need of the touch, touch that only the Lord can provide today from healings in their bodies to uh, spiritual touches, emotional touches. Some even need uh, touches in, in their finances. Uh, so we ask that if you have a prayer request, please send them in, and we want just to partner with you in prayer. So let's just pause. I'll put the names on the screen, and let's pray. Lord, as we come before you this evening, I ask that you would move and minister over these prayer requests. God, you are supreme. You are just, Lord, you're so mighty and so holy. And Lord, there is nothing that is too hard for you to do. And Lord, as you see these names just listed on the screen, Father, you know those names that are being sent in through the comments. You know those that are written on the doorpost of our hearts. And yet, Lord, you know those requests that we, we hide deep down within us. Those things that we're embarrassed to talk about, that we're embarrassed to even bring up. Lord, would you move and minister? I ask that you would touch in a special way. 
Father, those that need physical touches, emotional touches, uh, that needs a, your hand to work in a relationship. Father, those that are looking for employment, those that are uh, just going through different crises at this very moment, would you minister and move, oh God, and do it in a way that it's, that it's evident that it came from you. And Father, as your people, we're going to be quick to give you glory and honor. We're going to just testify that it was the hand of the Lord. And I ask that it would, uh, that you move in such a mighty way that it's evident to those that don't even believe in you that we may just share about your goodness to those that are standing on the sidelines, Lord, observing you at work. Father, I ask you to bless this time that we spend together tonight. Lord, that you would open our hearts and ears to what you're speaking and saying, that we will grow to be the church that you're calling us to be. Lord, that we will just be your hands and feet extended in this nation, Lord, that truly needs to turn back to you. God, we love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you worship with our praise team this evening? We continue with our series, Major Messages from the Minor Prophets. I hope you've been, been enjoying this. I, I know some of you have. I've been getting some text messages of how you've, you've enjoyed it. And just, you know, this really is a timely series for the, uh, the season in which we're living in. And even when you look ahead to this fall, when we have our uh, elections that are coming up, we need to make sure that we're praying for uh, 
men and women to be elected that's going to honor God and that's going to make decisions and pass laws that's going to honor God so that we can return to the, the spiritual, spiritual heritage that we have as Americans and that really America was founded upon. Now, here the, the minor prophets want to just remind you, just because they're called the minor prophets does not mean that their message is in no form or fashion belittled, okay? They have some major messages. They're called minor prophets because of the small amount of writings in which we have from them. Unlike Isaiah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, who has just volumes of material, theirs is more short and I say concise, but it's just more short and that's just what the Lord spoke uh, through them. And you know, it just wasn't for a group of rebellious, sinful Jews, but it also is for us today. It applies for us right now. And we, we tonight we're going to be looking at Zechariah, so go ahead, get you, your Bibles out, turn to the table of contents, and you'll find Zechariah is, is right there. It's the second to the last book in the Old Testament. And starting from, now last week we looked at Haggai, we're looking at Zechariah, and next Wednesday we're going to look at Malachi. These three minor prophets, they're different from the other nine. We've been studying these in chronological order. That means the order in which uh, scholars believe that they were written. And these last three, well, they fall in a different time period in which the first nine. The first nine, they all wrote about to telling you know, Israel, you better turn or else uh, something, judgment is coming. You're going to be sent off into exile. So these three, they are now after Jerusalem fell and after they were carried off into the Babylonian exile. Uh, and this is the group of people that came back. Uh, many, this is after the, many of them have spent many years in exile. They came back now to Jerusalem, to Israel, and they're beginning to rebuild, rebuild their lives. Last week, Haggai's challenge was for the people to rebuild the temple. And Zechariah, he challenged the people to rebuild their lives spiritually. Why? Because the Messiah was coming, not once, but twice. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. Now, most of Israel, I have to say, they, well, they, they was not ready for the first coming of Jesus. But we're going to see how God will prepare the Jews for the second coming of Jesus. So this really is a good time. I want to ask you a question. Is America, is America ready for the return of Jesus? What do you think? Let's, let me personalize this. Are you ready? Are you ready for the return of Jesus? You know, I hope the answer to that question is yes. So let me, let me do a follow-up question. Let's just, let's, let me take a poll, do a survey. Uh, watching out there, if you think that Jesus is going to return in the next hour, maybe hit that like button. Say, give a, a amen or, or send some sort of little uh, note there in the comments that, yeah, I think I do. But more than likely, most people, if we're honest, and I'm talking even of Christians, not many people really think that Jesus is going to return in the next 60 minutes. But you know, that would be the perfect time for Jesus to come back. Why? Well, Jesus would tell us in Luke 12 and 40, he says that you also must be ready because a son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus is soon to return. We don't know when. It could be the next five minutes. It could be in the next 60 minutes, the next 60 days or 60 years. We need to be living like he's going to come back the next second. We can't take that gamble. We can't play around with this. So let's look at what Zechariah 
what he begins to tell us. So with your Bibles open, chapter 1, let's start with verses 1 through 6. In the 18th month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Idio, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants and prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Now, Zechariah received about eight visions from God, and they're, they're all worth checking out and exploring, but for our study tonight, we're going to examine uh, four foundational truths that we can pull out of, out of Zechariah that he declares. They apply to nations, but they also imply, uh, apply to individuals. So let's get started. First off, God rewards those who return to him. Now, this is such an amazing promise, and we find it right here in Zechariah. His first message from God, it pro provides the theme of this prophecy. God would tell us in, in verse 3 from chapter 1, return to me and I will return to you. Now, we, I, you got to remember, think in context, these people, they have been born and, and raised in a foreign culture. The first Jews that was carried into exile, they were immersed into the Babylonian culture. And the next generation, their sons and daughters, they grew up in this culture, in this Persian culture. Uh, it was almost the wickedness and all seemed normal. But there, where they were at, there was no, there was no temple uh, to go into worship, or there was no longer even a temple in Jerusalem when they came back. So they had to figure out a way to draw close to God without a holy sanctuary where a God dwelt. But actually, while they were in the captivity, they're in Babylon, there was a, we could call it like a revival of devotion to God that began to surge. You know, there's a couple names I want to say that probably are familiar. Uh, some individuals that were holy and truly devoted to God. One was Daniel. Daniel, he started a custom of uh, praying with his windows open, and he would kneel three times a day, and he would always pray in a window that faced Jerusalem. He, as a result, with that praying with that open window, we know the, the story. This got him thrown into the lion's den, and yet God was with him. God closed their mouths, changed their appetite, and they just wasn't hungry that day. To this day, do you realize Orthodox Jews, they will stand and they will uh, position their bodies to face Jerusalem no matter where they're at in the world, but they do this when they read from their, uh, their prayer book. Also in Babylon, we find Three, three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they refused to bow down to this foreign idol that the king had built. And as a result, they were thrown to the fiery furnace, but that was not the end for them. God was with them. He was there and he would deliver them because of their devotion. It was even during this time of exile that we found the wonderful story of Queen Esther. Esther and Mordecai, they faced terrible persecution as the wicked Haman. He planned to kill all the Jews throughout Persia. Well, they worked hard to maintain their, uh, their Jewish heritage in this foreign land, in this foreign culture, where Esther was a queen. You know, as America, as America becomes less and less a Christian nation, 
you kind of have that feeling. It seems like we're living in a foreign land, maybe even a foreign culture. Got to remind you guys, this world, as nice, as comfortable as it is, it is not our home. We really do march to the beat of a different drum, as the old saying goes. Paul would write that we live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And it seems, well, to be getting worse and worse, getting more crooked, more perverse. But God's promise through Zechariah, it was repeated in the New Testament. The Bible tells us in James 4 and 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Has there ever been a time in your life when you felt closer to God than you do now? I tell you, he did not leave you. There must have been some time in your past where you moved away from him. There's a story about an old farmer named Cletus. He had a wife named Mabel. They've been married for, we'll say, I believe it was <clears throat> about 50 years. <clears throat> And one day they were out driving and Mabel, she was sitting there in the pickup truck and, and she just started kind of talking and then it kind of turned into fussing, complaining a little bit and it all seemed to revolve around the fact that, that her and, and, and Cletus, they didn't seem as affectionate as they once were. She would start talking. She said, why, Cletus, when we first got married, we would sit right next to, to one another in, in the truck. But now look at us. We don't even touch. Oh, Cletus, he just turned over at her, looked at her, and he said, well, Mabel, I haven't moved an inch. <laughs> Cletus was right. He hadn't moved from under the steering wheel the whole time, but it was Mabel who had slowly drifted to the other side of the trunk. Now, if you sense that you aren't as close to God as you once were, guess who moved? You know, no matter how far away you may have moved from God, you can always draw back close to Him. And as you draw to Him, He's going to draw close to you. Second main point we see from Zechariah is that God rebukes those that ignore Him. To that great promise of draw to Him, and He draws to us to come back, and, and He comes back to us, there's a flip side to that promise. Another side, other side of that coin, if you would. Zechariah challenged the Jews to remember the sins of their forefathers so that they would not make the same mistakes and turn from God. Because of their continual rebellion and disobedience, God would send judgment upon the Jews. And here's how God described the spiritual condition of those who lived uh, before the destruction of Jerusalem. Read with me, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Therefore it happened that just as he proclaimed, and they would not hear. So they called out, and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations which they had not known. Thus the land became desolate after them, so that no one passed through or returned, for they made the pleasant land desolate. Now our nation, it's not desolate physically, but it's becoming more and more morally and spiritually desolate. Zechariah, he warned the Jews to avoid the mistakes of their forefathers. Our situation is reversed. We should be embracing the faith of our founding fathers. Instead, this generation today is forsaking our great spiritual heritage. And really, we're seeing that the results of it, it's disastrous. You've probably heard it made mention before that the Lord, He's the perfect gentleman. Jesus Christ loves you. He loves you so much, and yet He loves you so much as a gentleman, He's not going to force you to follow Him. When an, in, when, when an individual or a nation continually tells Jesus that 
He's not welcome. That we don't want you in our schools. We don't want you in our government. We don't want you in the, in the public square. We don't want monuments uh, that's dedicated to you that reminds us of you. We don't want crosses uh, raised up towards the sky. We don't want you. Jesus says that perfect gentleman. Sooner or later, he begins to listen. And he honors that request. He lets that person or that nation, well, he lets our heart become hardened. And he pulls back. Now, throughout this series, uh, I've kind of said some of the same things. Some of the same things multiple times that we stand in need of a great spiritual awakening. Um, if we, that doesn't happen, well, um, America, well, the judgment of God is going to be coming. And, and it's possible that in some ways we're beginning to see maybe some uh, beginnings of God's judgment coming about America. You know, God doesn't have to send some supernatural visitation from heaven to judge us. We are simply, well, we're reaping the bitter fruit of decades of pushing God off the public uh, square in America. The Bible would tell us in Galatians 6 and 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. But what happens in our nation do you realize it's just a small little blip on the radar? It's just a small little bump in the road uh, in the history. Just something small compared to God's grand plan that He has and He's working out. Since, since creation, uh, God has been following His loving plan to redeem a sinful, fallen humanity. That plan has a name. And that name is Jesus. Zechariah would predict, wonderfully now, he would predict the first coming of Jesus, and he also predicts the second coming. So point number three, we see that the first coming of Jesus was as a gentle shepherd. Zechariah lived about 500 years before Jesus was born. And, and at this time, the Jews were anxiously anticipating the coming of the promised Messiah. Isaiah and the other prophets, they had predicted that a great king would come to Israel who would be in the line of King David. Now, this was exciting to them. And, and when Jesus was born, the Jews, they were expecting the Messiah but they were expecting him to be a great military leader like King David. They wanted him to come to, to ascend to the throne, to kick out the Romans, and to, to free them from the oppression from the Roman government. This Messiah King, they thought, would restore them to the same position of power when King David ruled Israel. Sadly, though, they neglected to study all of what the prophets had to say. See, they, uh, all the prophets, they predicted that when the Messiah came the first time, he would come as a suffering servant. He wasn't going to come as a conquering king. Instead, Jesus, he came as a gentle shepherd. Zechariah saw this because he would make these predictions about, about the Messiah Look here in chapter 2, verse 10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, verse 9 ought to sound a little familiar to you. This is quoted in Matthew 21. We read this in, at, uh, on Palm Sunday because this is describing Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. 
But the, the Old Testament is full of many more prophecies about the Messiah coming the first time, about Jesus coming. For instance, in Micah, it predicted that uh, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Zechariah would go on and he would predict that Jesus would be betrayed. He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. That money would be thrown down into the temple uh, on the floor. And yet it would be picked up and purchased a, be used to purchase the potter's field. Isaiah would predict that he would be silent before his accusers. And that he would be wounded and bruised for our sins. Isaiah would continue to tell that the Messiah would be executed with criminals and yet he would pray for his executioners. Psalms 22 predicts that his hands and his feet would be pierced, that his garments would be divided and won by casting lots. Now, I don't have time to go into all the, all the 61 prophecies that was made about this first coming and all 61 that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. See, not only are there all of those prophecies about His first coming, there's also prophecies about His second coming in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So here's the last major point. The second coming of Jesus will be as a conquering king. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? And when He returns back as Lord of Lords, He will be King of Kings. And there are several important prophecies about this second coming uh, of Jesus that Zechariah left us. And the first is that the Jews will return to their land. Now, of course, the Jews, we know, you Bible scholars know, they return from the Babylonian exile. And some of the commentators, they believe that these prophecies uh, regarding Israel... Uh, returning that it applied to that time in history when they came out of exile. But I, I, I have to disagree, and there's many others that smarter than I that really disagree with this because when you read Hosea and Amos, Isaiah, Zechariah, they all predicted a time when the Jews will return to Israel and they will never again be uprooted. The Jews returned after exile. And they, they did return 500 years before Jesus was born. But in 70 AD, the Jews would be uprooted from Jerusalem yet again. They were uprooted when the Romans came in and they destroyed Jerusalem. And for the next 1800 years, the Jews, they were dispersed all over the world. This period became known as the Jewish diaspora. But the Bible predicted they would return again, and this time they would remain in the land. Zechariah writes to us in chapter 8, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Now, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the Jewish people began immigrating back to the Holy Land. They were, of course, they were met with hostility, and they, they set up armed camps. But gradually, more and more Jews, they began to trickle back into Israel. After World War I, when the British took control of Palestine, the trickle, well, it became more of a flood. Isaiah predicted that the country would be born in a single day. And on May 14, 1948, the United Nations charted Israel as a nation. From 70 A.D. to 1940 A.D., Israel did not exist. Then, in a day, in a single day, Israel was born. This nation came to be. But Israel, it was confined to a narrow stretch of land uh, around the Mediterranean Sea. But in 1967, Israel regained control of Jerusalem again. And for the first time in almost 1900 years, 
And the Jews since then have continued to return back to Israel. In 2010, do you realize there were more Jews finally, for the first time ever, more Jews living in Israel than in America. Zechariah also tells us that the Jews will recognize their Messiah. When Jesus came the first time, he came to his own. He came to the Jews, but they did not receive him. Instead, they rejected him, and, and they turned him over to the Romans to be crucified. Now, as I study Revelations and the apocalyptic literature in the Bible, and from my interpretation, and some may disagree, but I feel that the next major event on God's timeline, I really believe is the rapture of his people. I believe that Jesus, the next thing is for Jesus to appear suddenly in the clouds with a twinkling, the fastest twinkling of an eye. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, those who are alive, we're going to be caught up in the air to be with the Lord. Uh, then there will be the, the seven-year tribulation that's going to happen. And during that time, uh, as many read and study, it seems that a lot of the Jews are going to uh, put their, their trust in Jesus at that time. They're going to begin to see that he was the Messiah. And at the end of that seven years, Jesus is going to return. And all the Jewish people, they will recognize that, you know, this was the Messiah. The week before Jesus was crucified, he stood on the Mount of Olives and he looked over Jerusalem and he began to weep. Weep just, just really to break down and cry. And he did this because of the blindness of the Jews. He said, you did, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. He meant that he was God in the flesh and the Jews didn't recognize him. He said, if you only knew what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The Prince of Peace came and their eyes was blinded. In Romans eleven twenty five, 25, Paul writes that the Jews have experienced a, we'd call it a hardening of you know, heart, hardening in heart. And the word means that it's like the Jewish people that they've got scales over their eyes or, or we would say cataracts in their eyes. And they're going to remain there until the full num number of Gentiles have come in. It's meaning that when the last Gentile accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior, those scales are going to fall from the eyes of the Jewish people and they will suddenly recognize their Messiah. Zechariah describes this time. He says in chapter 12 and 10, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one for they will mourn for him as one mourn for his only son and grieve for him as one for a firstborn. He says in 13 and 6, and one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. That prophecy is verified in Revelation. That's right. From uh, Zechariah all the way to what John the Apostle received on the island of Patmos. He says, writes in Revelation 1, uh, verses 7 and 8, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, the Talmud, uh, one of the, the Jewish uh, holy books, it says that when the Messiah comes, he will walk through the eastern gates, the eastern gates of the, of the city. And centuries ago, when the Muslims were in control of this area, they bricked up this gate that's on the wall. They went even as far as to 
uh, establish a Muslim cemetery in front of that gate with the thought process that a Jewish holy man, a Jewish rabbi, would not walk through that cemetery. And after all, it was walled up. That gate was walled up. So even if he was to walk through, he couldn't come through that gate. But I'm here to tell you, no cemetery, no, no doorway filled up with bricks is going to stop our Lord and Savior when he comes back, when he returns. You see, that brings to this last little sub-point. Jesus, when he returns, Jesus will be king over the earth. When Jesus returns to planet earth, he's not going to come in on a little donkey. No. According to Revelation 19, he'll be riding a white war stallion, leading the armies of heavens for earth's final battle. Now, this final battle has been referred to as the Battle of Armageddon. And it only, we gather this from, the Bible never uses that phrase, but the word Armageddon means hill of Megiddo, which only appears once in the Bible. In Revelation 16, chapter, chapter 16, verse 16, says that the enemies of Israel, that they will gather at a place called Armageddon. This area is a huge valley in Jezreel. It's about 40 miles north of Jerusalem. And this is going to be the final battle. It's going to be uh, what will be at Jerusalem. And according to Revelation 19, it will be the world's shortest battle. Because Jesus will slay his enemies with the sword of his word. Then he will set up his kingdom on earth and he will reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. Hear how Zechariah describes this event in chapter 14. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be, uh, shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north and half towards the south. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be, the Lord is one and his name one. The people shall dwell in it, and no longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. It has been several years ago, but the Sheraton Corporation, you know, they, they have large hotels and resorts. They were considering to build a, a large new hotel on top of the Mount of Olives. And they got with some geologists and they confirmed that underneath the Mount of Olives is a large fault line. It's running underneath it, the mountain, and it's headed straight towards Jerusalem. You know, they could have saved a lot of money that they paid those geologists if they would only have read Zechariah chapter 14 here. So as we conclude tonight, we look around the world and we see all the, the wickedness that's taken place. It seems that it's growing, not just in the world, but in our nation, sometimes even here in our own community. You know, we're constantly striving and fighting against attacks of the enemy. It, it is a battle each and every day to maintain the faith, to stand up for what is true and just and holy, and to, to live a life that's acceptable unto the Lord. And it can be tough. But I want to encourage you as we close and just coming out of this lesson tonight to remember that you are not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. You see, Jesus, He has already won the battle. He won it on the cross. And when He returns, He'll show Himself for who He really is. 
That is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. <laughs> you, my friends, uh, we aren't just barely hanging in there. We're already more than conquerors through Him that loved us. When Jesus came the first time, it was as the gentle lamb. When He comes the second time, it's going to be as the mighty lion of the tribe of Judah. And that's the time that every knee is going to bow Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I end with a question that I started with tonight. Are you ready if Jesus should return right now? See, only you can answer that question for yourself. And I pray that that answer is yes. Father, thank you that you have a plan and a purpose, that you are working it out. Thank you, Lord, that when it seems everything is just going down all around us, we don't understand and we try to make sense of it. And it's all that we can do just to, Lord, to maintain the faith. Thank you, Lord, that you are still on the throne and you're in control, that you have a plan and you're working that plan out. Father, thank you that you did send Jesus that first time as that gentle shepherd. Thank you that our eyes have been opened to him. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. Lord, for what was accomplished on the cross. Father, for that empty grave. Now, Lord, let us live a life that's pleasing to you, that we are looking towards that second coming. May we be living in a way that we're anticipating that each and every moment. And Father, in part of that anticipation, may we be be uh, about witnessing. May we be telling others that they need to be made right to, to get their, their home in order, their lives in order. Father, for we don't want to see anybody to go to that awful place of hell. You did not create it for humans. It was never intended to, to house human beings, but for, for Satan and his fallen angels. Lord, we don't want to see anybody to go. May we just be uh, just be diligent in sharing your gospel and your word. Lord, we love you. We thank you. I bless those that are listening, that have been partaking in these lessons. May you open, just help us just to be, Father, just sensitive to you, to your leading, guiding, and direction. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Looking forward to seeing you 10 o'clock this Sunday morning. Also, don't forget, send in those videos about what Daddy always says. Uh, try to get them in as soon as you can. I'm working on something special. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you soon.